Coming up next, Myra Strober is a labor economist and professor emerita at Stanford University. She was the founding director of the Stanford Center for Research on Women, first chair of the National Council for Research on Women. She is the co-author of a new book where a lot of people are trying to choose between love and money. Which one do I chase? Do I chase that thing that I that I absolutely love but doesn't pay well? Is there a middle ground? Well, she thinks that she's found it. We're going to dive into that. And Myra Strober joins us. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. I'm super happy that you're with us, Myra. We actually have some rain here in Northern California. Yay. Well, is it... Is it, isn't there, there's a song about that, right? That it never rains in, oh, that's Southern California. It doesn't rain, it pours, right? Is that the song? I don't know, but we haven't had this kind of rain in a while, so we're all excited. I was going to say, maybe, maybe needs it. Hey, it's, it's, it's funny because, you know, talking about rain, there's plenty of people out there, as you know, that rain tears when they think about having to choose between love or money. And before we dive into this project of with you and Abby, I love for the creators out there to hear the origin story of this. Why the two of you and why this topic of love and money? Well, this book was launched at a lunch. Um, Abby had been my student at the Stanford Business School. I taught a course for, oh gosh, close to 40 years on um, work and family. And Abby was a student in that course. And she had come back with her husband as a guest speaker in the course. And she uh, emailed me and said she'd like to uh, get together and have lunch. So she came down and we had lunch at this lovely little outdoor restaurant. And we um, talked about her career and uh, my career. And um, I had just retired and she um, was interested in what I was going to do next. And I said, well, now that I'd retired, I wanted to bring the content of this course on work and family. Uh, to a larger group. And so uh, as we were talking, I thought she would be an amazing co-author. And so I (laughs) asked her right then and there, would you like to co-author this book with me? Uh, And right then and there, she said she would. So uh, we were off and running. Uh, That's, 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 That's the origin story. (laughs) <laughs> that is that is fabulous. Well, and you describe early in the work as well that a lot of you, your career, speaking about retiring, your career, you had a love and money situation yourself in 1970. Can we talk about that? I think this is a wonderful personal place to start for a lot of our listeners. Yes. Um, in 1970, um, Uh, My husband and I moved to California, my first husband, and um, I had been teaching at the University of Maryland happily, uh, but he got a wonderful offer at Stanford uh, that he wanted to take, and we agreed that I would uh, leave the University of Maryland and come to California. And so I started looking for a job. at Stanford, and in those days, your thesis advisor really um, had to help you get a job. There was no open job market. And my thesis advisor didn't know anybody at Stanford, but he did know someone at Berkeley. And so I got a job at Berkeley, but it was not a regular faculty job. It was a, as a lecturer. So on my first day at Berkeley, I saw two of my former classmates at MIT in the economics PhD program, and uh, they were both assistant professors. So I made an appointment to see the chair of the department and asked him how come these two guys were assistant professors and I was a lowly lecturer. And he said, it's because you live in Palo Alto. And I thought, wow, you learn something new every day. I didn't know. I didn't say this to him. I didn't know you had to live in Berkeley uh, to be on their regular faculty. 
So I got in my car and drove home. And I always say I became a feminist on the Bay Bridge because it suddenly <laughs> hit me that this was ridiculous and that uh, <laughs> you didn't have to live in Berkeley. So I went back to him. Well, I called his office the following morning and they said he was very busy, couldn't see me for several weeks. And finally, I got to see him again. And I said, I want to pose the same question that I asked you before. And he said, uh, oh, I said, and, and I'd like a frank answer this time. He said, um, it's because we don't know what's going to happen to you. I said, what do you mean you don't know what's going to happen to me? I'm not asking you to give me tenure. I'm asking you to put me on the tenure track. And in six years, we'll all see what happens to me. He said, no, no, we can't do that. I could never sell that to the department. You have an infant and a three-year-old, and uh, we just don't know what's going to happen to you. So there it was, love and money, right in front of me. <laughs> and, and by the way, your course ends up becoming one of the most popular courses out there. I felt like reading it, like they had to see the light a little bit at a time, Myra. <laughs> just, just finally see, see the light and you brought them dragging. But you, you actually write this. I love this quote. Challenging times can force us to reassess our lives in ways that ultimately lead to better outcomes. Clearly, you've had a wonderful outcome, but that was a crazy challenging time. And I feel like the timing on this book, because of the fact that it's right at the end of coronavirus, there's a lot of people in that boat right now, Myra. I've got to believe there's a bunch of people now as the lines between work and love are more blurred than ever. Like this is this is a crucial time for a lot of people. Right. And a lot of people like to believe that love and money are separate, that you make love decisions with your heart and um, money work decisions with your head and never the twain shall meet. And the thesis of the book is that love and money are intertwined and you need both your head and your heart to make both uh, kinds of decisions. Well, she's not here to tell her story. Could you tell us Abby's story as well? Because you also kick off the introduction with Abby's story and the introduction of her and this, this issue. Well, Abby um, needed to make a decision. Um, I don't remember in the book which, which part of the st her story does she tell? Yeah, she was talking about her and Greg and about really which way, which way they're going to go. Is she going to, on one hand, she needs, she really wants this opportunity. On the other hand, her, her uh, 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 husband, I think, has this wonderful opportunity, but she may have to move. And so it's just right there in front of her. So is that Abby's story or is that a story that we tell? Um, I believe this may be a different story. Yeah, hold on. You know what's, yeah, you know what's so cool? I, think, I love that. I think, we start, I think we start the book with a woman who has just been admitted to graduate school. And we, um, we do. This is this is Lauren. Pardon? You're right. You're right. This yeah, is Lauren. Lauren. And that's the same time that she gets a proposal from the man that she's been seeing. Um, but he's not willing to think about moving so that she can go to graduate school. And so she has to decide, uh, is she going to accept this proposal or go to graduate school? And right. um, Lauren decides that she's going to go to graduate school. So um, it's, a, it's a very tough when you're in love with someone and they don't see that uh, your career and your life um, is to be considered. And so she broke off the engagement, and um, um, that, that's the story of Lauren. Yeah. The, w one thing that's clear from the very beginning, and you mentioned this just a moment ago, Myra, is that uh, the is, is planning. And we don't think about planning and love in the same sentence, right? Love carries you away. Love, love you know, you're enraptured. And yet you say that love is not a fairy tale and money is not a limitation. It, it, explain that because we don't often associate love with planning. So 
I, you know, I, I don't want in the least to denigrate love. <laughs> it's one of the most powerful and delightful emotions. Um, and of course, at first, it's different from the way it is after a while. Um, but we can't live on love alone. <laughs> um, not probably even on a desert island, but certainly not in our society. And so what we say in the book is, yes, be in love, enjoy love, but talk to this person about what your life together is going to be like. What is it each of you wants? Um, what is it that each of you is prepared to bring to the relationship? Um, and, you know, we can go into more detail on the questions we think people should ask. But, um, you know, it's not just that you fall in love and then you, you know, pick out your wedding gown and off you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it just, as I was reading, it reminded me of a phrase that a mentor once taught me, which is that, you know, love, love is not a noun. Love is a verb. And as a verb, it requires action. It requires work. And, and that is clear when we get here to the five C's which you you very much lay out the five considerations you call them the five c's it's the framework of the book and while obviously we're not going to take the time to go through all of it i'd love for people to dive in and do that uh once they hear this interview to get there though what i'd like to what people i think have to have to uh uh know to bridge before we get to the five c's is an idea from nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman, I think is how you pronounce his name. And you and they're called System One and System Two when it comes to your decision making. Can can we walk through this process briefly? Because I think this really sets up the five C's nicely. Yes, exactly. So Daniel Kahneman talks about system one thinking, which can be easily translated as um, making decisions with your gut. So a question comes up and you have a feeling, perhaps a really strong feeling, and you make the decision with your gut. Uh, and the funny thing is that, um, you know, Abby and I made the decision to write this book together with our gut. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're, we're fallible also. But um, in general, the idea that Kahneman has is that you shouldn't make uh, decisions with your gut. Um, you should use system two thinking, which uh, requires your head. And his point is that system two thinking slows you down. Making a decision with your head is a much slower process than making a decision with your gut because you have to think about uh, a number of things. And so in many ways, you're absolutely right. Our framework goes into detail about what you should be thinking about and how you should be thinking about it uh, when you use system two thinking. Fans of this show have heard us talk about, you know, a financial plan begins with beginning the end of, with the end in mind, uh, which is exactly where your five steps begin clarify what's important to you you tell this great story about lauren and greg lauren choosing between grad school and her love of greg she doesn't want to choose between these two things and they're pulling her apart the the the, the, the goals are are important but also getting i guess clear about how these goals rate against each other yes so what we talk about as the first step in the framework is clarify. Uh, clarify what it is that you want. And in the case of Lauren, um, she, after much thinking, became clear that she wanted a career, that she wanted um, to uh, spend her life not only with someone she loved and have children, but she also wanted a career. And the more she thought about it, the more this did not seem possible with Greg, because even at step one, stage one, he was not willing to consider her career in their decision making. So in her case, Lauren's case, clarify was relatively easy. She had only herself to consult about this <laughs> because she already had information from Greg um, that led her to understand where he was coming from. 
Um, when you have a couple making a decision, clarify is much more complex because you clarify for yourself. And then if I may move ahead just a moment to the second step of the framework, which is communicate, you need to communicate that decision to whoever else is involved. Um, and in the course of communicating, the other person has hopefully clarified his or her um, stance. And so each of you have clarified, now you're communicating, and guess what? My clarification for myself may change, may change a lot after I hear my partner's clarification of what it is he or she wants. So, <laughs> so this clarify and communicate can go round and round um, several times before the two of you uh, figure out uh, what your decision is going to be. This is what I love about Lauren and Greg's story, frankly, is that while it doesn't have a happy ending, Myra, for them together, it does have a happy ending for them separately. And, and sometimes this great communication creates this outcome that maybe doesn't seem happy in the moment, but we're all better off. Well, and that gets us to the last point of our framework, which is look at the consequences. Um, so, you know, in, in the long term, uh, their consequences were good for both of them. In the short term, the consequences were very painful for both of them. You know, yeah. to break up a relationship that's been going on for several years that might have resulted in marriage is just extremely painful. And so to be able to say, well, yes, I'm going to go through the short term pain in order to reap the long term rewards uh, is definitely part of decision making. Uh, I want to put a little texture on this step one and step two for a moment before we move on, which is your goals you point out are important. And I think there's a, a percentage of our audience that goes, yeah, 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 I know what I want. Okay, whatever. Because in my career as a financial planner, <laughs> that was always, yeah, yeah, this is not, okay, this is the boring. This is super important because you two point out that it's your goals that are important. And often we're dealing with the community's goals for us. And this idea that goals have been made that are truly maybe not my goal. They might be somebody else's goal. Well, I agree. That is really important in the clarification process that you may think you know what you want, but if you go a little bit deeper and sometimes you need the help of a therapist or a counselor to do that, uh, you realize that those are not really your goals. Those are the goals that your parents or your aunt and uncle or your teacher somewhere along the line uh, instilled in you. And in fact, if you are honest, you would, you would like to get rid of those goals <laughs> right. and substitute some other goals. So yes, that's part of the clarification process. Are these really my goals? Is this really what I want? Yeah. I feel like that. I feel like that's the basis of nearly every Hallmark movie people watched back in December, which was, you know, once they got clear about what they wanted, they they then decided not to marry Chad and things were. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, but but let's talk about communication here because you also write that, and I think this is important an important point. And I bet you saw this all through your career. You write communication isn't always polite and calm. Can you talk about that for a moment? Well, yes, um, it's, it's nice if both parties try to make it calm. Um, and I think it's very important when you are going to communicate something uh, that's, you know, possibly potentially life changing to um, warn the other person that this is what you have in mind and agree on a time and a place to discuss this, um, which, <laughs> which suits you both. So, you know, I think back to my first marriage and I remember trying to communicate really important things to my first husband, you know, after I had finished the dishes and he was sitting and doing some work and I'd walk into the living room and say, 
I need to talk with you about this. And he would say, well, you know, just a minute, I got to finish this page. And then he finished. And, you know, he had three minutes to talk about something that required three oh. hours. Uh, so oh. that, that's not a good way to go. Um, and it needs to be in private so that the kids are not, you know, waking up and asking for a drink of water while you're talking. <laughs> and, um, so set it up to be as calm as possible. And then, uh, yeah, the fireworks may erupt. And maybe you'll say, uh, too much fireworks tonight. Let's, let's finish this on Sunday when we go to X. So um, communication is ongoing. It can be tough. It can be a long process if you both keep clarifying and changing your mind. Uh, but that's what life is about. I felt like you and Abby were pilots and, uh, you know, I was just on a plane recently and they warned us that it, it was going to get a little choppy. And then five minutes later it was, I think warning people ahead of time that it's okay that this gets a little emotional is, is, uh, fantastic because I believe, you know, if these are big things in your life, of course, it's going to be emotional. The third step that you, that you walk through, and this is a big one. This was a big one in my personal life. Consider a broad range of choices. Are you saying that we, we, we look too narrowly at first? Yes. I think that very often when these love and money conflicts arise, they get solved uh, by coming up with a solution that none of you thought about before. And one of the examples we give in the book is um, two people uh, originally from China who um, both got business degrees, both got fantastic job offers um, in San Francisco and then um, had a baby and realized that they couldn't both uh, be in these jobs, which required a tremendous amount of travel uh, without having basically a third parent, which they defined as a nanny. So they did extensive nanny searches, including an agency and so on, interviewed a whole bunch of uh, people and decided that none of them would fill the bill. So how are they going to both have these amazing careers and this wonderful new child um, uh, with no nanny? And after much consternation, they realized that the answer to this problem is to move back to Shanghai where their parents lived and um, their parents, when they asked them, were willing to be the child rearers when they were on business trips. And so they asked their company and the company had offices in China and it all worked out. But at the beginning, had they not broadened their horizons and looked at choices that they hadn't considered, um, they would have been stuck in this, you know, how are we going to do this question? It, it, it's so powerful. It was powerful in my own life. Uh, Cheryl and I, you know, uh, uh, Cheryl was not happy in her job in Detroit. Things were going well for me. And we actually went through all of this personally. We, we started off with, well, maybe we will, we will commute back and forth. And then we thought about, well, does, 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 does Cheryl even, even need to work? I mean, it, 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 does she want to work? And so we went through this whole thing of what color is my rain? Um, and and should I should I continue or not? And we did that on hikes. We had such a great time with that. And walking through walking through this decision, you know what we decided to do? We decided on this weird thing after four or five days of talking, and it was we decided to sell everything and just become nomadic. And that's not actually what happened, but I d it definitely resonated with me when I was reading your story to not. To not take these first few things uh, and just stop there to really almost I feel like taking out the whiteboard and really thinking about all the possibilities and giving it some time. 
So that book, what color? I think it's what color is your parachute? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Well, well, that well, that's kind of what it felt like at the time. Like we should have had what color is your parachute? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember that book was was uh, very valuable. Yeah. In, yeah. in clarifying what it is you want. Just just going going through all of those, checking uh, step four. Check in with friends, family, and 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 other uh, other resources. Uh, just like I mentioned earlier, maybe having that whiteboard out and looking at all the different options, like your your uh, story about the people that moved to Shanghai, or my personal story. Uh, this th- this one seems very important because you might learn things that you didn't know were on the table. Yes. Um, the only caveat here is, um, you know, choose carefully uh, the persons that you check in with. Oh, so, good, you know, good, good tip. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, let, let me put in a plug for financial advisors here, because I think that a lot of people feel, oh, I can do this myself, you know, um, I can figure out when I should retire by going to some website and figuring it all out. And um, you need to check in with experts about <laughs> about your retirement funds and are they adequate and how should they be invested and so on. So you need experts, but then you also need um, friends and family, but you need the right ones. Um, and checking in can give you all sorts of um, ideas in terms of broadening your horizons, in terms of deciding uh, whether you're on the right path. Um, you know, checking in. Um, suppose you're uh, thinking about marrying someone um, and you want to know if a trusted friend thinks that this is the right person for you. This is a friend who knows you well. Um, introduce the person uh, to that friend and see what they have to say about it. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to take their advice, but it's good to know if people think that, uh, you're on the right path or on the wrong path. So I think checking in is, is a critical part of making decisions. The, the uh, it's it's funny. It reminds me of uh, Walt Disney, who used to uh, dress up in disguise and ask people in lines for attractions what they thought of Disney, and he got some, he got some really unfiltered responses when when he did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like uh, sending a draft. It's like sending a draft of an article uh, to people who write back and say, "Really." and then of course step five is explore likely consequences and i love how for for me myra this is a lot like the business world where we think about um you know we're thinking about uh uh this almost as if we're business you talk about businesses now have what's called a pre-mortem and um and this is very much like what businesses do yes yes so um you know, I think this is so important in retirement decisions. Uh, think about the consequences of you retiring. Uh, what What are you going to be doing um, every day when you're retired? Um, do, do you have a plan? Are you just going to let it flow? Does that work for you? Um, you know, lots of people retire because they have a specific thing to do. Other people say they'll figure it out after they retire, and some of them do. But thinking about what it is you're going to do um, and and how you're going to finance that uh, is really critical. The 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 book is uh, it's just an amazing project. It's called Money and Love: An Intelligent Roadmap for Life's Biggest Decisions. It is definitely a thoughtful look at love and money and about how you truly can meld the two of these. And I imagine it's available everywhere yesterday. Exactly. Thank you so much for including us in this discussion. And man, as a lead up to Valentine's Day, I think getting all this right is just a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Thank you.